Most of you listening appreciate that there's a ton of variance from one farm to another or even one field to another. But has our industry really started taking this into account in the way they develop and position products? You know, what makes our industry better in terms of innovation and sustainability still has to work on a farm. That's Randy Barker, co-founder and CEO of Intent. Over several years of working on farms, they've developed their own proprietary technology to provide data and insights on products, practices, and farmer perceptions. I think what's really fascinating is when we combine some of our market research or farmer feedback data. How do they perceive a yield prediction? Or how do they perceive the impact of weather? So the relationship to how they see the world and the data we present them is infinitely fascinating. Born out of their original service to help with on-farm trials, they now also offer software and services that serve as a window directly to the farm. I foresee in the next five to 10 years, and maybe less, that every product, just like it'll have a performance aspect of, hey, does this work, where and when, what is its net impact on carbon sequestration? Technology to increase the resolution and the context of what's happening on the farm on today's Future of Agriculture podcast. Well, hello, fellow ag nerds. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of the Future of Agriculture. My name is Tim Hamrich, and every week you and I get to hear from the founders, farmers, innovators, and investors, the people shaping the future of the ag industry. Have another great episode lined up for you here today. But before we get into that, I want to take just a moment to thank our quarterly presenting sponsor as we close out this quarter, and that is Calgary Economic Development. Now, what makes Calgary, Alberta the engine for Canada's agriculture industry? Well, with direct access to a strong agricultural base, Calgary is a well-connected region with collaboration across geographic areas, industries, and research and training institutions. Calgary has experts in all things ag, including primary production, crop science, protein development, ag and food tech innovation, and animal health. It's also a hub for controlled environment agriculture, energy transition opportunities, and value-added food and beverage processing. Calgary is a hotspot for agri-food production and technology development, which is why multinational agribusiness leaders call the city home. In Calgary, they're leading the agribusiness revolution, and you are welcome to join. Just visit calgaryagbusiness.com to learn more. That's calgaryagbusiness.com. And thank you one more time to Calgary for supporting the Future of Agriculture podcast. All right, now back to today's episode with Randy Barker of Intent. Randy is the CEO of Intent, which is an agricultural company focused on the use of technology to accelerate new innovations in agriculture. Randy is the co-founder of the business, which draws on his vast global experience in launching ag technologies in over 30 countries over the past 25 years. Intent serves a wide range of customers, from startups to multinationals, in their quest to improve adoption using data science and digital technologies. Longtime listeners might recall hearing previous episodes with Randy or his co-founder Kevin Heikis or others from Intent here on this show. Uh, they started the company around, I think, the same time I started this podcast, if I remember correctly. And we've always been really aligned on this mission to try to accelerate innovation in the industry. So it's been cool to watch their development. Today, Randy starts off by giving a little bit of an update on the company as they've evolved from managing farmer trials to offering a suite of digital solutions to customers and adding sustainability measurement and monitoring to their list of services. We also get a little bit into their approach to artificial intelligence, some of the continued challenges with on-farm data collection, and the importance of providing not only accurate data, but relevant context. I think that was a key insight here today. Randy began his career in Canada for the largest network of ag input retailers in progressively senior roles, ultimately as Director of Crop Protection. He then joined Monsanto Canada as Vice President of Crop Protection, serving agriculture, forestry, and industrial businesses. He relocated to Monsanto's global headquarters in St. Louis, taking on various senior leadership roles with global responsibility. His accomplishments then extend further from there, but I'm going to go ahead and just drop you into this conversation here where Randy's explaining some of the insights that drive intense work and their evolution to where they are today. If anyone's actually worked on farms or with farmers, you realize that each one is pretty independent and 
they operate differently. They may do similar things, but how they do them, who makes those decisions, how those individuals make decisions are all pretty unique. And, and I think what's really interesting about it in terms of helping farmers is understanding their individuality from how they operate in the land they're farming and the business they're running with what is common that can help many farmers. And, and that sounds simple, but as time passes and technology keeps moving forward, even farms are changing. So I think you, you put those all into a stew and it's pretty difficult to understand the parts. Yeah, it's just getting more and more dynamic, it would seem. Longtime listeners will recall, you know, we did a series of farm data related episodes with Intent a couple of years ago. At that point, it seemed like you all were were hitting this inflection point for Intent of, of expanding from more of a consulting type company, helping people with farmer trials, et cetera, to also adding this tech component of being sort of a, a digital enabler, digital provider as well. Maybe catch us up on how that's gone and how, how the company looks today. Yeah, I think like uh, most good things, they come through either friction or failure. And as we were starting out and, and running on-farm trials, trying to understand how does it work on a real farm? What are the differences? How do the farmers view it or feel about it? But at the same time, working with farm data was, was a primary skill. And we worked in raw data and processed it the old-fashioned way and, and did our data science. And it was very interesting. But we quickly realized that th this was, you know, fighting a losing battle, right? Climbing up the sand hill going, okay, we need to become more efficient. So that led us very much into building our Envision platform, which was really just bringing in processing, standardizing field trial data and looking at, at a very granular field level, subfield level to understand performance at a farm, but then also being able to aggregate fields across farms and go, gee, how's it performing across all those dimensions? So the problem that existed led us into building the solution. So we built Envision Trials, and then now we're on the new version of Envision Trials that is working at a much higher level and allows more of our customers to build their own protocols, drive their own analysis, engage at the farm level at a new strata. So it's been really rewarding. And along that journey, we also re-architected our whole infrastructure once again because so much is oriented to delivering a farm solution, there was very little for businesses or the B2B infrastructure to drive innovation. So if we think about products, practices, equipment, or looking at sustainability, everything is oriented towards the farmer, but the infrastructure to work with the types of data wasn't there. And that's how we ended up building Apogee, which is our infrastructure that deals with a lot of this geospatial unstructured data and brings it together. So our application is Envision, works great for Envision trials. And you know now we're into a new era with Apogee, which is an infrastructure that allows us to help customers and companies solve these problems with geospatial and farm data. And do, do these products always come with a service? So a company is coming to you and saying, hey, we need want to trial this product. And it's sort of like a full suite of services backed by Apogee and Envision. Or are they just saying like, look, we need what Apogee offers. We need that infrastructure. Let us use it. Yeah, we're, we're in this mode of change where, you know, if I describe the, the manual version that we started the company with, it, it was all service. And then we pivoted into a mix of service and, and software. Now we, we can offer really just software as a service. So if you're an Envision Trials user, you can use it to run your trials and do it your way. You can use the assets of Apogee. However, we still offer those services because a lot of times companies are navigating their way into solving their digital problems. So it, it's a good invention and maybe you know drinking some of our own Kool-Aid and, and saying, like farmers just don't adopt because you invented something good. We think our B2B customers are in the same way, that sometimes they go, well, we wanna be self-sufficient and use your technology, but maybe you can help us with some services to get up and, up and running. And we'll continue to run those managed trials, help find farmers, do good matching, help people understand how digital ag data can help them. Because if you're at a standing start or, or you know, the zero yard line, Sometimes they just need a little momentum to get them going to self-service. Sure. 
And and whether they use full service or, or self service, is the focus for intent still on on farm trialing of, of new innovations? Yeah, I th- I think we're you know squarely in that spot. The the farmer is the center, and if we think about two big drivers that, that's going to make ag industry better is particularly around technology or innovation, right? What products, practices, equipment are we going to be able to deliver and sustainability? So those two big, you know, what makes our industry better in terms of innovation and sustainability still has to work on a farm. So it's not merely about running a trial on a farm, but we're now engaged in monitoring and measuring for sustainability programs, starting to understand how to innovations perform on the farm after they've been launched. So it's no longer a trial, but it's a monitoring of commercialization or sustainability efforts. So that's been like a natural progression, but it feels really good because we're still 100% committed to, it needs to work on a farm for it to matter, but we're starting to bridge the gap to the big drivers of innovation and progress. And how do we start to measure and actually track sustainability yeah well let, let's talk about incentives for a minute on the farmer's part i could see if a farmer's interested in a product it would be in their best interest to trial that to say like hey i wonder if this is going to work on my farm if it is and i can spread it to more acres and great if i can get the company to sort of like pay for the trial that that's awesome but for something like sustainability where maybe a company just wants to know like hey can i make a farmer more carbon neutral with my product to, you know Maybe a farmer is less concerned with that in the near term. What incentive do they have to want to do all this? Yeah, it's a probably an unanswered question, but I think you tapped into something that we're spending a lot more time working on and thinking about is what is, you know, if we take a piece of land and you go, how do the practices reduce to minimum zero tillage and cover crops? How does that impact carbon sequestration? And that is still a growing science, but it assumes that it's just really about management and practices of the field. And how are we managing the soil? That gets a score. And I think we understand that pretty well. If you start thinking about the product side and then injecting that into that system, right, that parcel or that field, I think there's a lot of work and opportunity where companies want to answer that question, right? How does my product impact that field over time. And, you know, much like we said, product development was kind of skipping the whole precision ag aspect, right, of geospatial data, and they were advancing and developing products in absence of that. Well, I think we've seen over our tenure, right, so we're seven-ish years in, we've seen companies start to change how they develop products to be more precision ag oriented. I think the other aspect now will be how do my products impact my carbon sequestration or net sustainability, right? And I think they look at it in terms of persistence or, right, it's safety profile in the environment. They look at crop effect, right? Can I create more plant mass or carbon sequestration or am I changing the soil? And I think those are great questions, but like Precision Ag, we're, we're not quite at ground zero, but we're we're not very far along that journey, but I, I foresee in the next five to 10 years, and maybe less, that every product, just like it'll have a performance aspect of, hey, does this work, where and when, what is its net impact on carbon sequestration? And do we have the tools to really collect that data today, or is that what needs to change in order for that vision to become a reality? It's both, right? So there's traditional companies inventing products, and there's new companies, startups inventing products they're going to have to change that advancement process so that when you're at discovery or phase one, you need to be thinking about, okay, I need a new set of metrics beyond yield or whatever I'm trying to create. So sustainability aspects of how it impacts sustainability needs to be built in to the discovery and phase development process to commercialization for the innovators. And then at the other side, we're going to have to, um, start changing at the, what we're measuring at the farm level and kind of bring the two together. Because right now it's, it just seems a long way off. It does. Metric wise. <laughs> it's the right idea, but you know, it's, it's going to take some serious lifting and alignment 
And to your point is the farmers are like, why? Yeah. So I, I think that, and I know you used to, I don't know if you guys still do, you would kind of facilitate incentives for the farmer to do the trials in the first place. You'd, you'd kind of help match the two. Is that still part of the farmer trials product? Yeah. It's a premise, whether we're looking at products, right? Or, or looking at a farmer doing something different or practice, we're always asking them to do something. So we'll, we think it's fair to, to invest because, you know, a product may be beneficial to them, may also be a risk that's they actually could go backwards in terms of their output or productivity. So we always look to, to cover them and compensate them for their time and their effort and risk taking with a trial, whether it be a practice or a product or a sustainability effort. And I think that that's just to get them over the hump. They quickly become self-sufficient and figure out whether it works in their system economically, right? And if it's a good thing. I think for sustainability, it's a market right, for those carbon credits, at least now, and what other sustainable factors can be in that offtake. But kind of like the burden of precision ag is, you know, it used to be so heavy on the data side and the compute and collect and wrangle to get an answer. You know, farmers just went, no, thank you. And I, I feel like our efforts in sustainability maybe are at the same place. Although the program dollars are flowing, there's also this moment of how accurate are the programs in terms of what we're measuring? And the farmers will gladly participate in them, but you go, is the sustainability programs, are they sustainable? Are we actually measuring accurately and efficiently enough to actually know? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because, you know, that is, it speaks to the heart of what you do is every farm in every field in every year is all going to be different. And so when we're measuring against yield, we know that because we have yield monitors and we get yield data and we know very clearly like, oh, wow, we have to do this on a variety of different fields because it's, you know, our one product is going to have varying results based on all these conditions. Then you take something like carbon sequestration that we can't measure as clearly as yield. And we're trying to make those same type of claims with a product. So you're adding even more sort of dynamics. It, it just seems like it gets even more impossible to really make a claim about a product when the results can vary so wildly. And we, we frankly don't even have the data to even say that. You know, I, I, think, I think you're right on. I mean, it's early science and I think the science is pretty good. Hey, we know what the effects are. We've built some good models and directionally they're correct. But when you get down to a granular level of subfield, product selection in a system, you're going, man, that's, that's some pretty high resolution from where we're at today from measures. And I think your yield monitor example was, is pretty accurate because if you thought about yield monitors and, you know, auto steer and precision ag, when it first came out, it was kind of disconnected and, and parts. And we had some suspicion about accuracy and calibration of yield monitors, but given the engineering enough time, it starts to settle into a pretty reliable measure, right? I think people look at those not so much as it's directional. There was probably some variance, but net, net, there's been enough loads and tickets and way wagons for us to go, yeah, yield monitor is pretty darn close. I think that's where, you know, sustainability is at. And right now we're living in a theoretical matrix of, of data elements and some concrete soil measures that are done in labs, but you go, well, how much of the soil can you actually test? Should we believe it? There's a lot of interpretation to the accuracy. You know, I'm always the forever optimist that given enough time, you know, we'll kick enough dirt at it to actually make it shiny, right? It, it will get okay, but it's going to take some work. And it's not like yield where we were more entrusted with sort of a single device layered on GPS and other things. This one's pretty hairy in terms of a technical lift. On the other hand, the computational power and, and our ability to handle large data has improved immensely as well. So, I mean, on some level, that's what you're doing is sort of providing a tool to, to help a full-time farmer also be a researcher or, or conduct research at a, at a high standard with a way that doesn't totally take them away from their operation. Yeah. And, and when we lay that out, whether it's like a full field practice or side by side, we always default to how would you operationalize this, right? I'm going to run out one spray tank of this or a planter worth of this and 
you know, switch over practicalities, we can always work with the data on the back end to make it symmetrical. And I think, you know, that's just kind of the, the guiding principle of simplicity is it doesn't need to be simple for simple sake. It has to be simple for time's sake. They have a lot to do. And to get so sophisticated to try to make it a lab experiment in the field is, is kind of nutty, but their curiosity and accuracy demanded on the other end is kind of what drives us. And I think, I, I mean, it's pretty exciting when I think about the innovation, you know, whether it's planters or sea and spray, use of computer vision, drone, drone spray, variable rate, all the engineering is really catching up. The data offtake is increasing. Our ability to manage it is increasing. So, you know, the risk is how do you use that benefit continually to simplify for the farmer at a, a level of credibility they'll take, right? So I think that's that's really the balancing act. Yeah. Is there any uh, data point or data source that you're still hoping it gets easier to collect? I mean, outside of the, we've been talking about like carbon emissions, soil sequestration, that, yeah, I think everyone pretty much agrees on that. But anything else that uh, you're like, man, we, we, maybe we think we have this figured out, but we don't quite have that figured out yet. Yeah. No, I, I think, uh, you know, if we talk about our trials and, you know, we built self service software, we have APIs, the data is moving, and there's still some parts about that can be built in that aren't, aren't theirs, how do I actually know what product was applied where? In intrasystem, in the data, still requires that the farmer tags that. And for trials, you know, it's still a QA aspect of the process. So that, that'd be a nice invention. And I, I think as we start to add more sophistication, and particularly around computer vision on sprayers or on the cab, scanning multispectral, data layers, that's, that's really valuable. But like we said, with almost every data element that we look at was context. So no, no sensor really ever gets it done by itself. It's always contextual. So yield is, is good, but where did the yield come from? What year did it come from? How did that year evolve day by day, hour by hour from a climate standpoint? And then by the way, what, all, what are all the products you use? So I think that's kind of always the learning is how do we keep ingesting innovation and new sensors and new data sets, but not bring them in as a single single variable. And I think that's where we've learned and enjoyed a lot was we thought if we just measured yield, that would be good. And then we, about soils and weather and climate and other factors, products, water volumes, you pick the topic agronomy just keeps going. And I think on one hand, I see the engineering skyrocketing, which is fascinating, the level of resolution and the precision. And then I think about it from the data side of us, that how does all that volume fit? And what I, you know, we aspire to is how do we just keep that volume of data becoming interoperable and don't repeat our sins in the past, which is siloing a lack of connectivity. And I think I'm, I'm optimistic once again that I see the industry very much trying to solve interoperability. And it kind of has to be there so that the data can move in any direction to the right source and that creativity, whether it's at the farm level or an intent level or a multinational, that we're actually doing good with it, right? You know, there's always a lot of interest in owning and controlling. And you can do really well as, as a company by really focusing on creativity and problem solving. That energy sort of content, right? If I think of you know, content creation, whereas with data, creativity and problem solving is the highest order of value versus controlling a segment and trading it with someone else. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, sort of along similar lines, to what extent does intent have access to this data? Is it just between the company and the farmer? Or are you all able to sort of learn and iterate from the data, anonymized, aggregated, of course, for your own purposes as well? Yeah, we do all versions. So usually it's between the company, us, and the farmer as it relates to you know new products that are in development, 
that's what the company will compensate us for. And that's pretty logical that we're going to keep that data private. But we also have a lot of farmers that share data with, with us that we can use and we can use for our own purposes and aggregate some of those, those trends. And I think that's, that's where it's really actually pretty exciting because if we're doing it to make the total better, we're not creating a data solution that we just have to control and trade, but we want to make it available because it's progress. I think we'll see a lot more of that. And our aggregated data, I think a lot of it is different types of data as well. So obviously you can kind of look at yield, and soil and interactions and growth models and yield predictions, timing, growth application things. We're get able to tap into a lot of those things through Apogee and, and we'll make those available. We'll create little products that, that can solve bespoke problems. And then on the other side, I think what's really fascinating is when we combine some of our market research or farmer feedback data as to how do they how do they perceive a yield prediction or how do they perceive the impact of weather over the past five years on on yield or productivity indexes. So the relationship to how they see the world and the data we present them is infinitely fascinating. But I think we're at the place now where internally we're we're really starting to tap into our data with simple things like, you know, yield models and trying to solve for, hey, could we start to predict with some reasonableness the outcome of a trial in July before it's harvested, right? Because we've collected enough yield data, can we start to pin that? And that's, you know, that's a project we're working on where does the left side or the right side win? And you want to know in July, why? Well, because farmer says, well, I have to plan that field next year, plus my other corn fields. So I need to plan for this new practice now before harvest, not after harvest in, in January. So if we can bring that decision cycle back to land where the farmers are actually deciding stuff and planning, we're going to help a lot more farmers and companies get it right. So that's, that's kind of one use case that we're working on. No, that's cool. Well, back on the, the perception piece, so I, I know generally farmers are very data driven, but uh, where you say like the data and the perception, it may be dynamic. Is that because the data is just kind of a, a one dimensional and it needs to be factored into the broader operational picture? Is that sort of where perception comes in? Well, it's farmers are just like regular people, right? There's kind of the covert and overt, you know, we all are data driven. We think, you know, buying a stock is because it's going to go up. And it might be a long term or short term. But it's just really about the ROI. And if you ask farmers through, through our research, return, profitability, da, da, da. But when you continue to engage them, they're also trying to achieve other things in terms of stability, convenience, sustainability, and sustainability meaning I can farm for the next 10 years, not go broke and you know, engage my family in farming. Those things are equally important, but not, not articulated the same way as return on investment. And within context of that, just like every other human being, like back to my stock market the situation is, well, when the stock goes up, everyone feels good. And if all stocks start to drop, everyone gets anxious. And I think farmers read data, not only about their farm, but it's within context. And if you use that example, like, well, my ROI is changing based on the futures price of corn and how I've already marketed it or how much rainfall I got so far this year and my GDDs is going to impact how I look at fungicides. So, you know, that perceptual relationship to data, they're kind of their own supercomputer, right? Processing all the stuff that's happening around them. And they love data to support their worldview but they're computing at a high, high rate, which always makes it important to understand that they're data driven, but most of the data, as we've seen, is either latent or, you know, with maybe grain prices future. So they're trying to compile and assess all this stuff real time. And their, you know, sort of index on adoption goes up and down. There's some strong correlations like crop price, right? If crop prices Outlook or crummy, they're willing this to invest falls off a cliff, not a shock, but it can change in a day. 
right? <laughs> if you limit up a few days in a row, well, now there's a new plan. People are out of cattle and back into cattle. I mean, they're the consummate entrepreneurs always reading the market and all that data make the best decision for their operation, which that's why I find those relationships so darn intriguing because a lot of the performance or data that's related to sort of the climate and biology is latent. And then the other part about the perception is it's, you know, sentiment for a lack of better terms is a little difficult to read. So we try to understand those relationships, not to, you know, change the influence of a farmer, but to be more in tune with them. Right. So if we can actually be more aware as an industry going, oh man, this is, you know, we're starting to worry about rainfall and drought in parts of the Midwest. If we can be sensitized and aware to that, maybe we won't present such stupid ideas. Like, you know, as an industry, maybe we get a little smarter about being in the shoes of the farmer. And I think that's really important. That was really well put and very thought provoking. And um, when it comes to the work you're doing to collect on-farm trial data, how real time is that? Um, do your B2B clients, are they able to to get in tune in real time with the, the farmers and the data they're collecting, or is there some sort of delay there? No, I, we, we are, have made huge strides. So thanks to APIs with like climate or deer, that data, data is flowing. And having designed our software for farmers to be able to engage and, and provide real-time data that isn't machine data through our platform has really helped a lot, as well as our agronomists or, or our retailer. So now it's all everybody at once. So we're getting machine data, people data, agronomist data, retailer data, and all of that is as close to real time as we can get, which if you think about it is that's the collective, right? How is, how is all that data showing up? And if we can continue to, to work on capturing sentiment, it's extraordinarily valuable for everyone involved. Right. If you think of all the players from a farmer to a retailer to our agronomist or their agronomist in the company, everyone's interested. Their local rep is interested. The product manager is interested. The company itself is interested. Because if you think about it in a, in a positive, is streamlining that as to real time as possible allows everyone to understand each other a bit better. Is, is kind of how that works. And, you know, if we're all singing from the same song sheet, there's, there's less less chance for misinterpretation. Right. Well, I know we're running low on time, but I, I do want to ask you, you know, my thesis is, and correct me if you think I'm wrong on this, is that it's going to be the companies with the most access to proprietary data that that stand to benefit the, the most from advancements in artificial intelligence. I know Intent has been you know, working with artificial intelligence for some time, but but certainly we've seen some some radical advancements here. How are you all approaching, you know, AI and, and what do you think the impact of that will be on the future of agriculture? Yeah, it's a loaded question as to what is AI, but if you think about automations and informed learning models, I think the, the critical part is, you know, it's been data collect, is it QAQC? Now you can start to model something. And we we've, we've tapped into it by rebuilding the Apogee infrastructure so that we're ready for the AI future. And you know, one of our goals is to continue to automate and refresh and inform. So if you think about machine learning or a model, it's defined, but what starts to make it more of an informed or dynamic model closer to, to an AI is, is it getting better independently? And I think we're definitely investing in that so that we're learning as we go. The other part that's really interesting about AI, and if you think about language models and, and all the versions thereof is we engage by language, right? So this is this is our, our rubric. And if we can help people navigate and ask the right questions and frame problems, we will be able to tap into this depth of what would be geospatial, biological, environmental, and even sentiment data in the way that we communicate, which is language. So I see that as an opportunity and we're definitely focused on integrating that aspect of language models into the other systemic models because agriculture is a lot more about quantitative number or an index 
models and the two will cross over. And that, that speaks to, you know, where we were, which is we got to be efficient and convenient and, and more real time. So if we're always driving towards those things, that's where we see it at. And it's going to be, it's already having a significant impact, but I think we're just scratching the surface and maybe just in time. The other caveat though is you really have to do it, right? It, it can't be a theoretical part. And I, I think one of the reasons chat GPT was so successful was you let the people use it and they'll tell you how good it is or is not. And I think that's, that's where we'll see that in ag for sure is, you know, we've got to get it out there and let people use it and, you know, take the feedback and, and keep working on it. But that's my belief within a very short period of time. We usually are fast on our adoption, our Im implications, but I think this one will be, you know, if we said over the next, used to say 10 years, the precision ag will be important. I think we're going to underestimate this one because the cycle time on language modeling and, and the impact AI is going to be shorter. It'll be fast. This one, it'll, it'll be insidious in there before we know it. And uh, maybe in a good way, right? Insidious doesn't need to be bad, but it'll show up very quickly in many places. And I think that's, that's a really interesting prospect for us. And we want to be you know, true to our mission of does it make it better on the farmers? Does it help farmers be better? And does it help our industry be better? And those are kind of the guidelines for us to, to use it wisely. So I think it's as much a sort of ethical question as it is a technical one. Yeah. Where's the company at today in terms of personnel and uh, investment rounds? And just like give us kind of the, the snapshot of what it looks like in mid-2023 here. You know, we're around you know, 45 to 50 employees on a, on a regular basis. We have just our, our two founders and an investor, and we haven't raised any rounds in, in the last while. But, you know, even though we've been around a while, it's like we've been through three versions of our company and we're now on the third version. So we're like a startup again. We were a startup when we bootstrapped and startup uh, as we built the first level of software. And now I think we, we have to think bigger. We're operating in Canada, U.S., and South America and uh, continue to look at expanding global scope. And as our technology grows, I think there's, there's a lot more opportunity to continue to be really good at what we do technically, but the cycle time to build stuff is more than uh, six months now, right? So we're building more things faster, but the, the magnitude you know, we will probably be looking for partners and opportunities going forward that um, just keep us on mission. And I think that's just a natural part of being a little company, getting to a, a sort of a, a bigger little company. And I think we can grow into, into great things. And the part that keeps us really optimistic is as long as the farmers are with us and, and our customers are with us, we must be on the right track. That's the part that we're pretty, pretty ecstatic about. All right. Well, that's going to do it for today's episode. Thank you so much to Randy Barker of Intent for being on the show. I highly encourage you to go check out their website, learn more about what they're doing at intent.ag. Of course, that will be in the show notes as well. Always enjoy catching up with Randy or Kevin or anybody over there at Intent. They just always have uh, really great people on the team. So big fans of what they're doing and wish them the best. And thanks again to Calgary Economic Development for being our quarterly presenting sponsor this quarter. I really appreciate their continued support as our first ever repeat quarterly presenting sponsor. And last but certainly not least, thank you for your time and your attention. I really don't take it lightly. I'll be back next week with another story of ag innovation. Ag innovation.